All right, well, welcome to the board. Thanks for stepping Thank up. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, right off, we we'll, can just move into public comment. If any members of the public are here to say something or ask any questions, uh, now's the time if you wanna raise your Zoom hand. And just a reminder for those that aren't familiar, we'll have another 10 minutes at the end of the meeting uh, that you can um, say anything then too. All right. Um, with that, since I didn't get any hands, we can move right into the superintendent's report with Sherry. Good evening, everyone. It's great to see we have almost have 40 people participating. I think that's the advantage to Zoom. Everyone gets to hear and see what we're, we're about. Um, the first thing I'd like to say is that January is supposed to be uh, Board Appreciation Month. We're a little late, but the appreciation is still there. Um, I wanted to uh, thank you. Um, you know, I don't think people understand or appreciate the work of the school board, um, the impact that these 18 parents, concerned citizens and taxpayers have on our communities and education. Um, they're committed to maximizing the educational opportunities of our students at all six of our schools, offering a welcoming and engaging learning environment and providing educators with the resources they need to do their job. Specifically in the last year, I wanna recognize the board advocated for and funded the reopening of the Prosper Valley School. They led the work for a district anti-racism policy. They presented a budget that meant programmatic needs and supporting growth across the district, formulated a plan to address the needs and challenges of our middle and high school campus. They negotiated a three-year contract with our faculty to this, that started that with a new school year that hadn't happened in many years. And they supported COVID mitigation strategies that have allowed our schools to remain open. And I'm really excited and appreciative of my work that I've had with the board. Um, it goes every month, but especially this month. Um, each month I began this year talking a little bit about the presence of COVID and impact on our schools. Um, when we came back from winter break, we definitely seen an, saw an increase um, Raphael Adamek and um, Katie Burke did a really nice job and, and Raina organizing the data by school and vaccination rates and created a COVID dashboard that is still updated daily to give us an impact. What you'll notice is that our numbers have decreased and really stabilized over the last week. We've seen a real decline in the presence of COVID in our buildings, which is really exciting. It was tough there for a few weeks. Um, we've been supportive at the Agency of Education's test at home plan. Initially, we're a little challenged with test kits. Uh, last week, we did receive a large shipment of test kits and we now have enough for all of our students as well as faculty members who wish to, who need to um, be tested. In fact, we gave every faculty member at least one test, test kit. Um, We've also, I also wanna recognize how hard our school teams have worked to make sure our schools have stayed open. We've only had a few classes and I think Bryce has been probably the most impacted on, on this call. And here's our pre-K program at Barnard. Other than that, we've been able to cover for each other. Today, I saw that was the first day that I've seen all year that there was not a teacher absence from middle school and high school. I think Tina was doing backflips, but it's meant that people have really Put out efforts. I know that uh, our EST equity coordinator, Amanda Rank, and our data-driven uh, recovery coordinator, um, uh, Patty Kelly, were at Barnard Elementary to help, help John uh, cover in Barnard. So we're all pulling different ways, and it's really making sure that we can keep our, our schools open as much as we possibly can. Um, at the beginning of January and mid-January, the Agency of Education opened up the ARP ESSER grant, which is ESSER 3. Um, because it's a federal grant, it's much more detailed than previous ESSER grants. We've had to create two internal documents in terms of recovery and our plans for the use of money, as well as a very detailed uh, value, um, grant process within their system. Uh, that was submitted on January 23rd. We've had two amendments already or changes that we've asked, but we're really hopeful that within the next week, we should have that open and approved. Um, within that grant, it includes additional nursing time and district association associated with ESSER positions, including, oh, I'm sorry, uh, ESSER positions, additional technology resources, after school and summer programming costs, and ELA professional development and curriculum. 
Um, in the future, we will be adding um, some of the building systems, increasing air quality and other capital improvements. That's even a more complicated process that Jim, Fenn, and Joe are working on. Um, some of the other work of the, of the month is working on our transportation uh, and bus stops routes, and I'll have a presentation for that later in this meeting. Um, the, the leadership team has been working on, again, improving teacher supervision and evaluation, which is one of my goals for the year. Um, the group's now identifying what we would like to hear from teachers and see from students in our classrooms that support the characteristics of our portrait of a graduate. Um, once that work is accomplished, the team will also look through the different lenses um, that we use for teacher evaluation in terms of um, using them as our guiding educational documents. Um, our hope is to create a shared vision for exemplary teaching and learning that will be a standard for all administrators and teachers. And finally, I wanna invite all board members. We have a, our last or second all district in service on February 28th at the auditorium in the middle school high school. We'll be working with Dr. Lavelle Brown who met with us uh, in November looking at uh, how do we inspire and enhance the capacity of school leaders and community members to foster equitable school environments and promote culturally responsive and inclusion to meet the needs of all learners. Dr. Brown is the superintendent of the Ithaca School District. Um, he was well received by the faculty and staff in the November meeting in terms of helping us have conversations around becoming an anti-racist school district and um, thinking about our definition of equity. Um, the focus will be more on classroom practices, but also just having that bigger picture. He's also been meeting with the faculty and staff once a month and during without administration present to really create some brave spaces for them to have conversations around equity and becoming anti-racist teachers. So that's my report. Raf, you wanna go next? Oh, I'm sorry, Adam, do you wanna ask a question? Go, go ahead, Adam. Let's see the hand. Um, I just wanted to hopefully have an update about after school programming, knowing that it's non existent in uh, a handful of our schools right now. And I know we talked about in terms of um, grant funds in the last year, we hired a position just to oversee after school programming. Um, it's certainly kind of an ongoing frustration and challenge for a lot of parents and families of juggling jobs and uh, having it, not having it. Um, can we get a status update on that? Um, I think it's different for each building. We continue to recruit. We continue to look for positions. They've been posted in a variety of places. Um, I see John's on the call. John, do you want to speak to Redding and, and Barner? <clears throat> well, I can, I can just say that, that the problem in both Redding and Barner is finding um, enough qualified people to, to run the programs. Um, we have reposted the Barnard, oh, I'm sorry, the Reading position. Um, the, the Barnard position has been posted for months. Um, I mean, we take it down, then we repost and, um, we just haven't gotten anyone. Woodstock is the same way, I believe. Um, I don't want to speak out of turn for Maggie, but I know, I think they've, they're down to two days a week. Um, is all that they can provide staffing for. Thanks, John. So, so I, I, wish, I don't want yeah, I mean, to. I wish I could give you like a, a, a date that I thought that we could fill these, but it's it's. Yeah, I know. I, I absolutely appreciate and understand the you know the labor shortage that exists. Um, I guess my request as a board member is that we try and prioritize moving forward, particularly as we start talking about next year, right? Um, how do we, this is, a, this is an important programming that, you know, historically existed at local levels and now it's, we've uh, put it over, uh, under the kind of supervision of a district level of how do we create a really problem solve this, particularly if we have a position at this point, and I don't want to pick on this person, but that their job is to oversee after school programming, how do we make it happen? I hate to say it, but I think more money. I mean, that we're, we're, you know, employees are going other places. Um, you know, we pay, I think we're paying $15 an hour and people are making more. Yeah. 
And so, and, and yes. partly, I believe we're charged with making it self sustaining. And, um, you know, there's that yin and yang of what can parents afford um, and how can we make that, that work? Um, Jerry, did you want to say anything more to that? Or should I go to? No, I think that's that's part of the tension. Is that um, we've been, you know, given the charge to make sure that the program pays for itself, that it, we're not using tax taxpayer dollars to support after school programming, and so um, even by with the rates that we were charging, we were very close to the line whether we were making it self sustaining. It, it's a difficulty. But I mean, we are ongoing, and I know Aaron Boucher, who's the you know, extended learning coordinator, has been doing all kinds of pieces trying to bring people into that position. But we are having a hard time with substitute teachers, with faculty positions. We are posting now for making sure we have all our teaching positions filled for the fall. Uh, it is a concern of ours, and we're working on it now. But thank you, Adam. I know it's tough. Uh, Jim? Yeah, Sherry um, and John, what Killington did prior to COVID, I think it was three years ago, since I have the luxury of being a select board member and a school board member, um, you might want to touch on basis and maybe these other towns would want to do the same thing that Killington did. The town of Killington had a part-time rec director. Um, we ended up putting our job out for a, a full-time rec director with the correct schooling for to be the after school program uh, instructor. And right now it's been what, three out of four years, Sherry, that um, Sarah Newell is our uh, rec director in the town of Killington, but she's running the program for the elementary school. I think maybe some of the towns should be looking at that. Because that would ask one of the John, well, that might have to help what John was saying because you could probably offer somebody more dollars per hour, but it's only a part-time position if I'm correct on that. We have reached out to the Woodstock Rec Center and they're not interested in partnering with us um, with our after-school programming. So, but we'll continue to look. I know that's been great for Killington. It's really been helpful. Yeah, I think you're, you're hitting the nail on the head um, as far as the, the part-time hours go, because I believe the postings, some of the postings are for a higher rate of pay, but it is only limited hours after school. Um, just for the record's sake, as technically I'm the, the Barnard Rec Director, I don't want to do that, Jim. Um, so we'd have to, and we're not paid in smaller towns. I think Woodstock and Killington are the ones that pay, so. I was getting really excited, Bryce. I thought you were going to do the after school program. So, so Bryce, to help you out, we got rid of the one director that wasn't qualified and we put it out as a full-time job. So maybe this is a chance for you to get off the Rec Director. <laughs> Um, Todd, go ahead. Hi, everybody. Um, John, what what is the uh, the fifteen dollars an hour? What is the uh, total hours per week, and how many people were we looking for? And then, um, because I'm new, um, was just the self sustainment aspect just something that came up with the vote when this was all created? I, I take it. Yeah. So the fifteen dollars an hour, at least in Reading. It's uh, the people are paid for three hours a day, so 15 hours a week. Um, the, the person who we call our site director is paid a little bit more and gets paid for three and a quarter or three and a half hours a day because they have some other responsibilities that they have. Um, at uh, So pretty much at all of our after school programs, it's the same um, number of hours, about three, three hours a day. Um, I see. So it definitely is hard for someone to, even if it was a higher wage, like Jim was saying, it's hard for someone to get in the car, leave their potential family and just go for a couple hours and do this work. So maybe there's some sort of, and this might exist, forgive me for not knowing, but maybe there's some sort of working group we can put together on this to find out if we can combine some potential jobs and maybe look for some uh, funding um to try I mean, everyone has it's the biggest thing i'm hearing and it, it really it really breaks all our hearts obviously and we can't make people work but i think again to jim's point not many people even if they need 15 dollars an hour could do it for a few hours and that that's so maybe, maybe there's something we can go and i'm happy to do any research on this if anyone wants me to do that i'm happy to do that thank you todd 
Yeah, and just just to follow follow the other question, Todd, I'll I'll just say that yes, when the when the program um, started, kind of along the lines of pre K, the idea was that it would be like a self sustaining uh, a program. So not that that couldn't change, but when that when it was established a few years ago, that was kind of the the light in which it was established. But again, at this point, right, money a few bucks an hour might not make the difference anyway. It's probably a bigger conversation. All right. So uh, next up, I guess we can move on to Raf. Thanks, Bryce. Uh, good evening, everyone. A uh, couple of positive notes to share from our technology work over the past month. Um, first, I just wanted to point out that our enrollment saw a jump of 11 students over the past month, which was a, a good increase um, around the semester transition. Um, we also received uh, this week an order of 50 wireless access points that were ordered uh, 11 months ago. Um, so that's been on the agenda for a while. I'm very excited to get those. Um, we can, so those are slated to be put in, in the middle school, high school and the Prosper Valley School. Um, and so we're, we're really happy to be able to complete that installation finally. Um, another good piece of news, uh, we, Hi, we're working with EC Fiber. So EC Fiber completed an installation at the middle school, high school in order to provide um, a redundant fiber connection to that building. Um, and this is exciting because we'll, we'll be able to have um, fiber connections through two different networks, um, which should really mean that there should be no reason why the internet should ever go out at the middle school, high school for external purposes. Um, so this is a, another positive step forward. And lastly, um, we conducted a training uh, on Learning Ally for a number of our educators. Um, so we're beginning to roll that out. Um, and this is our solution with over 80,000 audiobooks um, for for struggling readers, uh, K through 12. Um, and that's, so that's starting to gain some traction. We're starting to see usage across the district. Thanks. Great. Uh, Bill? Just a quick question, Rep. So it's 11 ads to the student body, not 11 students who left, correct? Yes, yes, in addition, okay. yeah, yeah, a net increase over last month of 11 students. Got it. I saw the parentheses around the percentage, and I didn't know if that was a negative or just a wave. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Good evening, everyone. I'll go next. Um, lots has been going on in our department. I'll give you a few highlights. Um, we finished the compliance activities for Vermont AOE for January 15th, and we're moving on to the next round of compliance activities due in March. Um, and I'm also working with the Southeast region. Um, we're developing our own collaborative, and um, that's starting with developing a new board um, with the support of Nate Levinson, creating systems and programs that are needed so we can share resources within the Southeast region, especially for um, shortage kind of positions, like when you need only a 0.2 PT or you need these little pieces of people as we were just talking about with the childcare thing, the same thing happens in special education. Um, also excited to be working with um, Dr. Katie Novak. Um, we have a work group that is addressing key findings from our inclusionary practices self-assessment. And one of those key findings that she is going to help us um, figure out, a primary driver is developing common planning time. And when we're talking about common planning time, that's beyond grade level time. It's so that you can have general ed teachers, specialists, special educators, literacy specialists, math interventionists, et cetera, all being able to come to the table to problem solve and program for students. Um, our student groups have been very active this month. We have the high school, middle school QSA group, um, they recognized LGBTQ plus Black History Month with a display in their enclosed bulletin board. They attended the library led presentation of the flight of the puffin and they had a visit with Anne Bre um, Braden via Zoom, um, who's an author. Um, the Social Action Club also had um, an author and a UVM professor, Dr. Emily Bernard, come and share her experiences as a Black woman in primarily white spaces, um, as well as sharing other stories of other um, writers of color. And we have um, 
Uh, we provided a follow-up EST and MTSS professional development for all the elementary teachers that was um, overwhelmingly receiving positive feedback on moving forward and taking those steps. It is a big process and we're taking lots of chunks, which I know that Jen will talk a little bit about some of the pieces we're looking at regarding professional development and how we get there regarding literacy and math and how we really look at those universal supports and tier one and two interventions within the classroom setting. Um, and then finally, um, we want to just recognize all of the staff, we're coming up on a break here, but you know everyone and all of their efforts to keep our schools open, to have their focus be on students, and to keep going in these times, and to do so, you know, willingly and hard work. It, it's really amazing, and we have a really wonderful district and staff here. So I just want to give that a shout out because it's a lot of work, and I'll pass it over to Jen. Thanks, Gina. Hi, everyone. I'm Jen Stainton. I am the Director of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment. Um, and uh, so what I'd like to do is first share an update on our tuition reimbursement benefit to teachers. So to date, our teachers have accessed over 240 credits to grow themselves professionally, despite the stresses of this particular year. And not only are they growing, growing themselves, they take that and they bring it back to their classrooms and their leadership teams, and they make our systems of learning way better. So I wanted to say thanks to the school board for this incredible benefit and to teachers for accessing that benefit. And it just enables our district to be a really wonderful place to both work and learn. Um, I also wanted to um, talk about our district equity um, for literacy and coherence team. Uh, they continue to meet monthly and they're making progress through another round of the course titled with literacy and justice for all taught by Julie Brown. And I believe we have a board member who will be taking the course this time around. So that's very exciting. Um, in addition, they're engaging educators across the district with the most current research on teaching reading through a literacy choice board. And that choice board is actually linked in the board packet. I highly recommend if you have some time clicking on that link and seeing the resources that educators will be accessing. Um, it's going to be a really great time to learn about literacy and faculty meetings. And finally, they're planning ahead to some great professional learning in the 22-23 school year. And as you know, tonight, the math equity team is gonna be presenting. They're all here. It's very exciting to see their faces. Um, they're leading change in our district by leveraging the knowledge and vision of our really skilled educators. So welcome to all of you. We look forward to your presentation. Um, January brought the close of our winter local assessments. So STAR and Dibbles and Forefront and um, educators are digging into the results of those assessments to better support their students. Um, and thanks go out to teachers for making all of those assessments happen. It's a pretty heavy lift, but it's a very meaningful one for our students. So thank you for that. And finally, the work necessary um, through the consolidated federal grant programs underway. So that's titles one, two, and four. And so that gives us a great opportunity to think about how we do intervention and other means for improving student outcomes. That's it for me. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Jim? I'm having internet troubles, so if it out with my internet, um, we've through the month we've only spent forty one percent of our budget, which is in line with prior, but um, we're about forty one percent spent. At this point in time, we've got three or four areas where there's a pattern of overspending. Um, one of those areas is our pre, because of enrollment, we've added two teachers that weren't budgeted. And um, we will be getting additional revenues for those. So um, there is an offset, but um, that's over and above what was budgeted. Uh, another area where we're having some uh, Overspending is in our food service program. And a lot of that's due to the extra work and costs for meals in the classroom, but also just the fact that we've seen double digit increases in our food costs, um, and getting the food. In the third area where we've had some um, 
issues is uh, buildings and grounds, in particular, uh, the Prosper Valley School, just getting that building up and running with the issues that Joe dealt with uh, over the summer, and the high school where the aging infrastructure is costing us, causing us to spend more money than we anticipated to um, keep it operating. Bottom line, we're in good shape. So these are not, you know, big alarms, but um, it's certainly caused to keep an eye on other lines to make sure that areas that are currently underspent remain over underspent to offset them. Um, at the moment, uh, except for monitoring, we're not taking any other actions. Um, I'm also in the process after our finance committee meeting of a couple of weeks ago of writing the RFP for uh, transportation. That should be ready and go out this Friday for a return um, in about three weeks and uh, to bring it to finance committee in April for their um, recommendation to the full board. And uh, the auditors are coming back tomorrow and Wednesday to wrap up the field work for our annual audit. Uh, we do anticipate having the final audit by the end of March. Uh, we do need to file with the federal's, federal um, agency for the grants by March 31st, and that will be done under the Single Audit Act requirements. Uh, that wraps it up for me. Thanks, Jim. You'll see, just if I can add on, Bryce, you'll see at the bottom there, there's, there's a report from Cat Robbins on our partnership with Marsh Billings Rockefeller, Rockefeller National Park. Um, if you have a time to read through, it really is uh, reflective of the, the great work Cat Robbins does for us and how we continue to build on those relationships. So that's what that that piece at the bottom of our, that's. That's, that's a good call out. I read it. I read it and I thought, geez, that seems kind of out of place, but I, <laughs> I did click the link and see what it was. So. All right. Next up, I think we have some students here. I saw Genevieve pop up earlier, and I think there's some others. So if you guys want to take it away, it's your time. Um, I mean, I can hop on really quick unless I'm competing with anyone else. But uh, hi, everyone. Uh, good evening. Uh, I really like my my role here is pretty simple as honored as i am to be here i basically just represent students but it's been made pretty uh not super complex by students not doing a lot of like crazy petitioning or having really upset like radical ideas but and i think that that has to do with how well run this district is but i have seen um in these past few weeks i saw one like pretty cool student proposed um, district-wide vaccination mandate. So this was proposed by Adrian Gus, who's a high school student. Um, and basically she was calling for faculty, staff, and students uh, who are in person to have a mandated uh, COVID-19 vaccine and to have a more actionable stance on mask mandates. So I thought this was an interesting thing, it was signed by a lot of high school students. So just to, to kind of purvey this to you guys um, from a student perspective, that, that was really all that I was seeing recently. Overall, I think we're doing great. Thanks, Owen. Uh, yeah, thanks, Owen. I also want to say that there was an anti-petition to that petition, um, which was interesting to see. There were a number of students who also signed the anti-petition who were against the proposed um, or the idea at all of a vaccine mandate. So I thought that was interesting to see. Um, just kind of like the student voices clashing, because usually there isn't much going on in terms of student voice. So that was nice to see. Um, there is some kind of concern about the upcoming schedule that, that's about to be tried out this week. Um, I don't know how that's gonna go. Um, I'm interested to see how it works. I did not mind the current schedule, which was 90 minute classes on Thursday and 80 minute classes on Wednesday with the R time, but that didn't work for a lot of the underclassmen students. So hopefully 
uh, I think it's a 75 minute class uh, schedule, something to that effect. And then there's staggered um, our time. So that should be a little bit better for keeping students who are just otherwise roaming the hallways a little bit more in check. Um, I'm interested to see how that goes though. Um, and next time we have a meeting, I will provide my feedback. Um, yeah, thank you, Jenna and Owen. My name's Aiden, and um, I'm also a student representative of this board, and I am uh, so grateful that I could be here. And I want to kind of follow up with what Genevieve was saying about the uh, schedule. Um, we originally have, I believe it was 90 minutes on Wednesday, too. It was not four 90-minute classes on Thursday uh, with no breaks in between besides lunch. And then Wednesday, we had three 90-minute classes with some R time breaking it up. And we realized that students were um, really uh, find it exhausting and uh, hard to uh, stay in classes. For instance, on Thursdays, it was four and a half hours in a row. And we just found that that was really tough for students. And so uh, Mr. Smale, the principal of the Woodstock um, Union High School and Middle School, sent out a uh, survey asking, like, what do you value in this uh, schedule? What would you like to see change? And he offered a proposal uh, saying like, all right, we could do like 75 minutes uh, classes instead, have our time, more our time, split up the classes a little bit, make it easier for students to uh, get through the day. And uh, many of us, uh, I know I was one of them, provided feedback about that draft saying what we like and what we would improve on. And now we have this new, um, this new schedule, which I believe it's 80 minute blocks, Wednesday, Thursday, more our time. And um, yeah, it's going to be implemented on Wednesday and Thursday. And um, if uh, there's any feedback, I can also give next board meeting. I also want to um, point out that uh, the renaming committee of uh, the board has um, uh, crafted a survey for um, getting feedback about the, um, the rebranding of more specifically our district, but we will also be working at the um, uh, mascot of the uh, high school. And uh, we have the survey and we, I personally took the survey and I have shared, shared it with uh, Ms. Fallon, which is the ninth grade English teacher at the high school. And we will be um, talking to different students and um, uh, just the social action club which is a club in the uh, middle school and high school, which talks about, um, discusses topics about you know, racial inequ inequity and other inequities um, happening in our community and in our, on our, um, in our state. Uh, and we're also gonna be sharing it with the student council to get feedback from the students before we finalize it and share it with the community. So we will, um, add that and I could also give more feet, uh, follow up about that during our Wednesday meeting and I believe that's all I have uh, for today. Thanks. All right, anyone else student body wise? No, thanks. Thanks Owen, Genevieve and Aiden. We appreciate it. I'm definitely, definitely value hearing your perspective from from where you're at and uh i'll be curious to see what you guys think about the schedule changes for sure all right next up um, before we get further into the meeting wanted to kind of recognize we have a couple board members so this is going to be the their last meeting with us as board members anyway um sarah and kelly uh, are both uh, leaving after this meeting and just wanted to say first for me just you know I've, I've known you both different varying amounts of time Sarah was actually probably one of the first parents I met when I moved to this area like seven years ago started a base the baseball program in Barnard and her son played for me so I've known her for longer though she's um, only been on the board for a couple of years but I've always appreciated her uh, you know perspective on issues when we're talking about it and, and Kelly I just want to say you know you um though you were in this area years ago, you've, you've been out of the area and uh, moved back and we had a vacant seat and she immediately kind of stepped up and 
and and took that role. And I think she she did it very well. And again, offered some great perspective on the policy committee. Um, they're both on the policy committee, so we're losing two more from the policy committee after Lou. I don't think it's the committee itself that's making everyone leave. Just for the record, um, I'm but- the only one left. <laughs> we'll talk about that later, Sam. Um, yeah, there's like an underlying <laughs> theme here, Sam. What's the story? Good luck, Sam. <laughs> Guys. Um, we will be looking for some other members to fill that, but there's a couple board members, I think, that want to say something as well. Yes, I wanted to say um, that um, I've gotten to know Sarah through um, her working with the configuration and enrollment group. Um, and she was an asset. She gets out and talks to people in her town and area. And it's been very helpful to have uh, had a second board member on that um, group when we did the uh, Prosper Valley reopening. And um, and she's going to be traveling to Peru with me on Saturday on another front. So along with her son. So we look forward to that time. So thank you, Sarah, for your work and for your um a willingness to to talk with your constituents and bring back uh, the information. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to both of you for your time on the committee um, policy. That is, uh, Kelly had some really great um, inputs and helped with the naming policy that was a beast to get through, we all know. <laughs> um, and uh, Sarah's input on her community and things that a lot of people were telling her was always really helpful. Um, I'm only a little bitter that you're both leaving me alone on the committee, but it's it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Um, thank you so much for your uh, for your help. Really appreciate it. All right. Thank, thanks again, both of you. And then enjoy your time not having to come here unless you want to. All right. Um, next up, going into the math goals and visioning. I know I saw Sheena. I don't know um, who else is here, but I've seen a number, a number of faculty actually. So take it away, guys. Hi, I'm um, Shana Kalnitsky, and I am joined this evening um, by a few other folks who are going to introduce themselves. Um, Devo and Hector, go ahead. Hi, my name is Devo Sleeper. I am the one of I am the math interventionist at Woodstock Elementary School, and I focus on additive reasoning. Um, I'm also a parent of a third grader at West and a kindergartner at West. And I'm Hector Kent. I am a seventh grade math teacher, primarily um, working in the middle school and also a parent of two students at West. <laughs> I'd like to also note that we're um, joined by Paul Bremel and Melanie McGovern, who teach in the middle school and the high school. Uh, and uh, I didn't add what I do. I work at the Killington Elementary School as an instructional coach, as well as a math and reading interventionist in grades K through three. So we wanted to um, thank you for having us tonight. And um, our work is driven by the domain of academic excellence in the portrait of a graduate. And by strategy 1.2 of our district strategic plan that states we will achieve a high level of math proficiency for all students through curriculum review, classroom instructional practices, professional development, and robust intervention so that all students may reach their full potential. Tonight, we'd like to take you on a little journey with us, hence the, the cool picture, so that we may inform you of the work that we have done thus far. So to frame the work we're presenting, we think it's helpful to reference a slide that Sherry shared with the WCSU staff on our first day of back to school in service. Um, and it includes the Vermont AOE's definition of educational equity. So Sherry said, what's our charge for this year and years to come? It's to create an inclusive community where the worth and dignity of each person is honored. And the definition here of educational equity means that every student has access to the resources, opportunities, and educational rigor they need at the right moment in their education, whatever their race, gender, identity, sexual orientation, ethnicity, religion, 
language, disability, family background, or family income may be. And then if we take this and fast forward a couple months here, we'll go back one, Shana. Oh, sorry. All right. One moment. So if we fast forward a couple months to the next in-service where the whole WCSU staff came together, we were fortunate to hear Dr. Brown talk about his definition of equity. And you can see on the screen here that he says equity is reducing the predictability of who succeeds and who fails, interrupting reproductive practices that negatively impact diverse students in school settings, and cultivating the unique gifts and talents of every student. And this definition was especially interesting to us because it seems to summarize many of the conversations that the, what was the summer math work group and became the math equity team began in this path to past June. Thanks, Sheena. Oh, thank you, Sheena. So this June, with the support of Jen and Sherry, a committee made of 11 members came together to talk about the math needs across WCSU. Led by a consultant, we developed draft mission, vision, and goals in five focus areas for WCSU mathematics. In August, we came back together to take another look at the goals and to begin thinking of action steps that lead towards meeting these goals. We collectively read the book, The Math Pact, which details how to establish whole school math agreements that promote cohesion and overall equity across schools and classrooms. In October, we transitioned from the summer work group to what is now called the math equity team. We became the math equity team met monthly, welcomed new members, and continued planning action steps for the 2021-2022 school year. The first action step we decided to focus on was to collect feedback from administrators and teachers on the draft vision, mission, and goals. In December, we presented our draft mission, vision, and goals to each school. We also extended an invitation to join our work. We are thrilled to expand our group to additional areas of instruction, including a superintendent with extensive experience in special education, a counselor, a curriculum coordinator, and a data coordinator. So Shana is now going to give you a look at, at our work. So take a moment to look at the heart of our work. This draft represents our most current version that will be again revised as we review the feedback that we collected from teachers across the district. One of the things that drives our work um, in this math equity group is something called collective efficacy. And collective efficacy is the belief that everyone in the school is a change agent and every single person is capable of having a positive impact on student achievement. As we work with Dr. Lavelle Brown and Dr. Katie Novak, we haven't been distracted by this new learning, but we've actually been focused as we delve into our equity and universal design for learning studies. We want to thank you for those opportunities to expand our learning and thank Sherry for leading the math equity group. There's actually a palpable excitement in our work. We're no longer just a little bunch of math nerds. And as DeVoe stated, we have representation from grades K through 12 and all different specialties across the district. And please join us, uh, you know, in, in enjoying this work that we bring to the students as we uh, streamline and prioritize and align. We're not adopting new programs or curriculums, but agreeing to have the same priorities for excellence in math instruction. And again, thank you for having us this evening. So I'm going to do an addendum. This is an amazing group of math teachers and educators. Um, as Shane has said, it's a much more diverse group starting, um, we've added a few people, um, and it took me great restraint to not join the work in the summertime, but what they resulted in was just powerful pieces, and I just enjoy being with them because I see the energy, dedication, commitment, passion 
to do and move our math, uh, making our students mathematicians. And that commitment is just so exciting to see. So I know that was a brief presentation, but I just hope you know that this is a huge body of work and they are such change agents that I, I am so proud of them. Awesome, thank you all so much. Thanks for coming tonight. Thanks for having us. All right. I'm glad we get to lead off with that. It always makes me feel good to hear about from the from the directors and from, from faculty. And now, now, Sherry, we go back to you with buses. <laughs> I, I know, I did show the math group. We're going to lead with you because the next stop is bus stops and transportation. <laughs> so equally, it's not as equally important, but it's important. But I, I'm glad we've led with math and we can jump into uh, transportation issues. Any questions? We have such good math brains here. Any for the board in terms of the work of Melanie, Shana, Hector, DeVoe, um, Paul, just just don't want to move too quickly beyond that topic. So you left them, you know, you guys did such a great job. You truly impressed them. So thank you. And you guys don't have to stick around unless you want to learn about bus stops, but the board has to stay. So let me share with you, I'm going to put this in slideshow. So this is a conversation I call bus routes for 2022-2023. So this is future, some future thinking. Um, and how do we get here? So um, in September, on the first two days of school, Raina Bishop shared with me that she received 200 contacts from parents to increase the number of stops in our bus routes. Um, that 200 does not include the number of calls that principals received, that the bus company received, that I received. So that really got my attention. In October, um, I did a review of the current bus routes um, I recognized the increased number of stops, the range of start times, and the frequency of stops against those different routes. And so I presented this information to the board finance committee, um, addressing those issues and asking for guidance on funding. Um, because in order to make sure that everyone had the same access to the bus, it would mean increased costs for the bus. And so the Board Finance Committee informed the superintendent that additional funding was not available in November for transportation to increase, to address the increased demands for stops. Um, the Finance Committee also agreed that a consistent practice for identifying uh, stops needed to be in place to provide equity and distribution of transportation resources. So in December, I met with, we brought together the principals and we brought together Steve Landon, who is the uh, Butler Bus Local Manager, uh, Transportation Manager to establish criteria for uh, bus stops and um, to, to draft some possible stops. In Fe uh, February, um, I'm here to present to you what that criteria is and some possible routes. My intention is that on February 22nd to have a Zoom meeting across our communities to answer and address questions and concerns from parents regarding this plan. So considerations. Um, first, the purpose in terms of this uh, process or procedures is that we really need to ensure that consistent procedures are applied in the determination of bus routes and it stop and stops across the district. And I'll show you some of that variability in a minute. We do have a WC issue transportation policy, which identifies the um, need to review stops annually by the superintendent administration. Um, and what's really important, not just that they're safe and efficient, but they're an economical system. Um, it's a, as a reminder, transportation to and from school is not a legal mandate in Vermont. It is a, a service that we provide. Um, in terms of costs, our annual budget for transportation is close to $500,000 annually. Each additional bus is almost $55,000. Additionally, some other factors that we've had to deal with this year um, regarding transportation is there are not enough bus drivers. So in the event that someone's sick or has COVID or needs to quarantine or whatever, we've had a number of days that we've not been able to provide transportation, especially in Pomfret and, and, and Barnard. Um, the first pickup time ranges from 6.15 in the morning to 7.05. Um, the current bus process impacts the start and end of school. We have one, you know, Reading Elementary starting at 7.30, others are starting right before eight. And this really makes a significant impact on you know, our programming as well as the length of ride for certain students on the bus. Um, it was, you know, Aaron 
Cinquemani, our new principal, when he first arrived, that he, he, he was really surprised to see how much the bus route and process is impacting our programming. So here's a table that I use to compare bus routes. And again, this was data on at the start of the school year. I'm sure things have changed, but you can see the number of pickups, when the first pickup is, and the number or the average daily ridership. And some of them, again, this is just in the morning. Afternoons can be very different depending upon sports and practices and if we're traveling, transport some people to different times. But you can really see how different when we have 19 uh, stops um, in Pomfret, uh, Reading, for example, and the average daily ridership is 25 students. Um, and at the same time, we have 75 to 80 students on Killington One and three pickups. So there really was some significant variability that I wanted to address. Um, if you wanna see deeper where the routes I picked from, um, that where it says WCSU routes, that's a live link to the routes that are in place. So if you want more information there. So in December, when I met with the principals and with Steve, we talked about what were the criteria for establishing bus stops and routes. First of all, the stops must be safe. Um, we, we were really picking up some students. Um, some bus stops or pickups were one minute between each stop. And that was many times throughout the process. And so where the bus was stopping or kids were crossing, there were concerns about that. We need to allow for multiple cars to be parked, waiting for drop off and pickup by having fewer stops. That means more students are getting off in one location. And so there are more vehicles at that point. So we need room for that to happen. We cannot use a non-public road. So we can't use, um, you know, for road conditions and road postings may alter road, the route as necessary. We can't use a driveway or road to back up or turn around with the buses. Um, the initial, another issue is that bus drivers cannot pick up or drop off students at non-designated stops. So parents and even students have asked, can you drop me off here? Can you drop me off here? We really have to stop that practice. Safety issues, um, challenges, but again, the number of stops along routes has, was so small. And so um, we also agreed that there would be no less than one mile in between stops. So if someone was midpoint, it would be half a mile to one stop or half a mile another one. And the, or from the distance from school would be a mile. Um, some of this criterion has been challenging um, for some locations for housing and stops in terms of more travel time, um, basically because of finding a safe place to stop and having um, access to multiple parking areas. So before I present the model, some of the advantages that have come to um, fruition by having this model and by making this revisions to the bus stops, we're having a more equitable access to school transportation. Um, some parents have already been doing this. Um, I shared this with the Parent Advisory Council, and they were talking about that at, at you know, Hewitt Corners, many parents are driving to the stop already. So that is not a new expectation, but it's now going to be an equitable expectation. Um, we, will, we will have more than one route for Reading students. So we will be starting the Reading route, one of them at Downers Corners, so closer to Weathersfield, bringing students up right through through the high school. This would eliminate the Route 106 transfer of students. And so many of you who live in Reading know that uh, for our middle school, high school students, as well as our fifth, sixth grade students, there was a, the bus would stop on 106 and students would move from one bus to another. We won't need to do that any longer. Um, we will be able to make sure, ensure that all runs begin after 640, which is in the board transportation policy rather than 615. We will add a pickup in Heartland and it will come up through Heartland up through Tassville. And so hopefully we'll be able to pick up more students in Heartland. We will extend the route in Plymouth um, down until Echo Lake and the Echo Inn. So again, hopefully adding some Ludlow students. And that starts and end of schools are within 10 minutes allowing for district-wide PD and more consistent programming. So this year we've had, with our late starts, we've had some issues about Reading starting at 7.30, other schools starting at eight and making really difficult to have district-wide PD. So this would address that. So here's what we're proposing. Um, this is the, uh, it's hard for me to see uh, which route this is because I can't see the top of my screen. So here's the, I think the Woodstock, one of the Woodstock runs. Here's, that uh, was Woodstock one. This is Woodstock two. Here's Woodstock three. You can see we've significantly reduced the number of stops. 
Killington One Middle School High School route. This was, and Jim will remind us, we were down to, I think four or five, we're back to that. Again, spreading it out, all places where we can safely park. Killington Morning Run, the Barnard Morning Run. Again, looking at those major points along the route. Um, this is the Pomfret Run, then running the number one, which starts at Tyson Park Road and coming down over the Tyson Road. And here's the link to all the current routes and proposed revisions. And so if you wanna see the before and after, and I didn't have room to do this on our slideshow, but that gives us um, the more detailed comparison. So where we are right now in terms of the process is that principals are reviewing those bus stops, um, ensuring that we're spreading them out, looking at problem areas. Um, all the principals have had the route since last Thursday. I've gotten some feedback. Um, our plan is now to move this uh, proposal to parents. And so we, you know, after tonight, if this if goes forward, we would have uh, announce a meeting to all community members for input, post these provisions, make last revisions. And our goal is that in the beginning of April, we will post bus stops, Parents will know in advance where the bus is picking up and we will be able to uh, not, you know, last summer we were making transitions and planning bus stops right through summer, right up until mid-August. And now parents will know in advance where the bus stops are um, and we can address any singular um, issues. But the goal is really to make sure that everyone has access to the bus, but that there's equity of access. Jim? Yeah, Sherry, can you pull up Killington One again? Sure. And in the past, this was always done by the boards, but now since we're um, a supervisory district or whatever, I guess it got pushed over towards you guys. But Roger, myself, Jennifer, um, and others that were on the, between the elementary school and the high school uh, board, you know, we really had knocked it down. And I was really, shocked when you told me there was some 13 or 14 bus stops going on because we had it down less than what you're proposing here. So when I'm looking at this stage road and coffee house road, I mean, it's, um, that should be combined to one, in my opinion, when you um, get to that. I mean, it's the same block, really. It's called stage road at one corner. At the other end of the corner, it's called coffee house road. I believe Coffee House Road was um, the stop that everybody was getting off at because they could walk down the one road and get to wherever from there within a mile. Um, can you pull up the K Killington number two bus route? So I'm just, and I'm not, I'm not gonna be able to make it to the meeting that when you do this with the public or whatever, but if I'm got this right, it starts at Bridgewater. It goes through US Route 4, Doubleday, then Barts Hill, then Clear River, then Pittsfield, and then all the way out to KES. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And this is okay. a plan that, so Steve met with Mary, and I think Mary's on this call um, that okay. agreed with the, yep. Okay. As I think one of the things, if Mary is on the call, just make sure that, because then, well, this will get Pittsfield later, but then those kids from Bridgewater are gonna go all the way out to Pittsfield and then all the way back to the school. Yeah. Um, I guess it's a lot early, a lot later of a time to be in picked up. So if everybody's good with that, but the biggest problem you guys are gonna have, and I'm gonna tell you, Jennifer and Tony, myself and Roger, when we're sitting at buses, people will be complaining about getting not getting picked up and they want to be picked up at their house. And as board members, we would just sit there and say, it's not our job to get your kids to school. Be happy with the bus stops you got. Um, so if you could just pull just one more last time, the Killington two bus route that I could look at. I think and then when, that and Killington two. This is, okay. here you go. I, I saw Pomfret at a minute. I, I, Pomfret's up. There we go. There's the okay. Killington too. So if Mary, Mary, if you're on this call here, wouldn't you be looking for? Uh, wouldn't you be looking for a bus stop 
up somewhere around on the Killington Road, more than a mile away. Well, you, Jim, I, I talked to Steve at Butler Bus about on his way back from Pittsfield, maybe doing one more stop so that people could meet the bus coming from Plymouth or mm -hmm. that end of, of Killington, Plymouth or, or Bridgewater. And we thought right. about, um, I know the high school bus stops at Shops at the Shack and, right. and doing another pickup there on the way back through. This, this route that you're looking at right now is about an hour long. Um, right. And um, yeah. that is a long time for the Bridgewater little ones to be on. We, he did have some concerns about coming up, and, and I think the, the high school bus does this now, but coming off Route 100 north and to go to shops at the shack. But the high school bus does that now, right? The high school bus does that now. If we're talking about um, safety, to be honest with you, and then there's businesses there, you'd be a lot better off with the high school bus or and even the elementary school bus than coming back from, uh, from Pittsfield would end up turning right onto Route 4 instead of waiting. You know how when you're coming up Route 100, Mary, you're yeah. sitting on that uphill and you're looking over yeah. your right hand shoulder. Yeah, it's got to be a pain in the ass for a bus driver. Making really a right hand tough. turn towards towards the post office and using the far side or the closest side to Route 100 of the um, the, the Killington Deli and Marketplace. That's what I would do. And I, I think you had an issue this past year at the um, the shops at the shacks. And I know because I've been on a phone call with Matt Kinsman and them at the um, the at the ski resort, and they would like that stop to be stopped. Yeah. Do you think Cl that Cliff Cliff has no problem having the bus stop in his area over there? Yeah. Do you think that the doing an interesting time? If you guys don't mind, I'm I'm gonna yeah I'm gonna, I'm gonna right. move on to some other board questions, but encourage you guys to to talk it out All for right. local okay, reasons. Okay, good enough. Yeah. Bye bye. Yeah. <laughs> Adam. Uh, two questions. Um, is there kind of an average length of time that we are getting students on the bus for, or like, I guess more not average, what's the range? Um, I heard Mary just mentioned an hour, but are we seeing more than an hour on the bus? No, if we're picking up students after 640, you know, between 645 and school, most kids are arriving by 745. So an hour is the longest. Most of the bus pickups are right at seven o'clock and getting kids at school 740, 745. So, okay. um, it's and then the, rare, the, and I think like Pittsfield is the furthest one out on one side. Right. You know, Donner's Corners would be the furthest on that other side. Okay. Heartlings. And then just the second question is: Are we ever combining? Um, I think this was happening at one point. Are we combining elementary school with middle school or high schoolers on the bus at all? So Reading, we're going to be able to separate that out to the most part. So, you know, fifth, sixth graders going up up one hundred six. That'll all be on that uh, Reading. One or two, I'm not sure which number that is. Um, whoops. Um, and then the other Reading bus will be all elementary. There are times like Barnard where there's only one bus. And so, yes, it would have middle school and high school and elementary. Um, there are some Woodstock buses that are combined. So we've now separated out middle school and high school in Killington, middle school and high school mostly for Reading. Um, but there's still, because of we're trying to reduce the number, keep right. the number of buses the same, there will still be elementary and secondary students together. Okay. Uh, Bill, and then Todd up next. Thanks for doing the work, Sherry, on this. I know it was a, a time-consuming uh, process. Just a quick question. By us dictating, and I don't mean that in the negative connotation, but setting up these routes, that has that's not going to impact Jim as he goes out for the RFP, is it? And you can talk to Jim. Actually, Jim is taking this information to create the RFP. Great. Yeah. I agree with Sherry. Um, the timing is perfect, and it really fits in well with my plan, and I'll just include these routes in our RFP, so we'll be all set. Thanks. Really appreciate the hard work. Thank you. All right, Todd? Todd? 
Uh, oh, did you, just, did you just call me, Bryce? <laughs> Sorry about that. This is this is this looks very complicated. For what a great presentation on it. I would I would ask one thing that, and then point a point a thing out that's dear to my heart. But um, is there perhaps folks on the periphery where it's adding a stop somewhere in all these areas that perhaps people might think about uh, some sort of carpool incentive? Because I, I would say long term that would be a bad idea because people go to different schools and all this, but perhaps since this is a yearly sort of thing, at least that's what I get from the top sheet. Um, is there is there any kind of way to engage people or certain areas of people to see if there might be an interest in that? Is there any way we can incentivize them to offset an additional route or two and maybe make your math easier and the cost lower overall? So we are hoping because we're getting this out so early that we're giving the opportunity for parents to make those partnerships, to talk about what makes sense in their communities. Um, I know our principals are really connected to those families. They know who lives who. Those conversations happen on a pretty regular basis. Um, but we really think by having this information out so early that where parents will need to, some may need to, some may want to, um, combine efforts in terms of children getting to the bus stops and covering for each other. We've seen that happen. I know when I lived in Barnard, that happened all the time. Okay. Um, so that's the incentive. Get it out early so people yeah. can have those conversations and know what the expectations are. I think, you know, clarity is kindness. And so having that expectation early is better. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that's that's a great point. And then um, with the dear to the heart, the, the Tassel store next year will have a lot more parking. Uh, it's pretty crowded in there with the folks that are getting the bus. I assume most of them would walk, but they don't. There's lots of cars in our parking lot, but um, we're going to make a lot more safe parking. So hopefully if there's anyone that's not going to that stop uh, because it might be a little dicey, that, that won't be the case come at the end of the summer. Thank you. Yeah. And you'll have good coffee. Great coffee. <laughs> uh, John, do you want to say something and then Matt? Yeah, I'm going to volunteer to supervise that stop in Woodstock by the good coffee. Um, <laughs> but no, what I really wanted to say was um, so people know that another benefit of this and, and Sherry touched on it, but um, will be the school start times are going to be um, pretty much the same. Um, the high school, Prosper Valley and Killington will all start at eight and um, Barnard, Reading, and Woodstock Elementary will start at 7.55. So very close start times. That's never happened before. Thanks, John. Uh, Matt? Yeah, and that actually related to my question, which, which was how, how did this impact programming? Because I didn't follow that. Uh, when you said the old routes were impacting programming at the schools. So it's, it's challenging because we, we share um, our universal arts people. So we share our special educators. So we have a lot of shared teaching positions. So if someone's getting at 7.30 at Reading, it impacts the, when their day ends at the end of the day. So they're not available to the fullest extent at another campus. It impacts professional development because the teacher's contract for Reading, they're starting at 7.30. That's our expectation. So late start days. Uh, myself and Patty Kelly go down there to cover students so that they, the Reading teachers can participate in the same programming as the other teachers. Um, there are lots of smaller pieces and John and Maggie or Mary may be able to speak to it, but really the shared teaching positions that's impacted, special educators that's impacted, uh, professional development. So um, it, it all relates, I, I, yeah, I really wasn't following it. So it just really relates to the fact that some schools had to start at different times and others because of the buses arriving yes. at different times. And this will go to a more consistent start of school, which John pointed out. And length of day too. We were having some weird 30 minutes <clears throat> longer day, 30 minutes shorter. We can be really consistent now in terms of everyone's start and end and time, length of day. Um, and then just a comment, I mean, I would show sort of the before and after, like how many stops before, how many now and, and, and compare like the length of time the student was on the bus at the longest to now what it is at the longest, just so you can kind of quantify those improvements. And, and I would consider, um, you know, if you have a ton of pushback or if it creates hardship for a family that maybe didn't expect this to happen in April, you know, three quarters of the way through the year, that we consider implementing it 
at the start of next year. I mean, I, I don't, hopefully that's, that's the not. Plan. This is not going to start now, Matt. This will be. Okay. Fall. I thought you said uh, go to the public and then implement in April, but you're going to start next fall. Got it. Right. We'll post it in April and have it on our website so the parents can plan for next September. Okay. Thank but you. But I, I thank you, Matt, for that, that, um, that feedback. In fact, I, I just, let me show, I'll do a quick run through and you can see what we were uh, addressing. And let me just get, um, this has all the different tabs. So you can see, oh, hang on one second, I'm trying to get to a really good example. But here, oops, you can see here, for example, in the afternoon on Woodstock 2, um, eh, it doesn't show it as well. Let me pull up the best one. So you can see, and it doesn't have all the new stops, but here we were having, sometimes there wasn't even a minute between drop-offs and reading. Um, two minutes, three minutes. Um, and so that was happening on multiple uh, other locations. You can see the number of, here's Pomfret. Again, we had a 7, a 705, 704, 708, 709, 710, 711, 712. So the bus was stopping constantly. And I think that's part of the other is the energy piece. I mean, that's, these buses are stopping and starting and stopping and starting. And what would happen is if at 708 pickup, student was late, your impact of all the other stops would significant. So someone who was waiting for a 730 tow pickup on stage road, because there was always a delay at the beginning and there were so many stops along the way, just one little snafu and you were impacting all the other people down the route. So I think this is a really good example of how often the bus was stopping you know, at one point we have 732 three times between Library Road, Stage Road, and 10 to 85 Stage Road. And now we're going to have this much more refined um, process in terms of stops. And there's a mile between. And so it's not that it's a huge distance, but it will mean some movement and some, I'm sure, lack of comfort for certain individuals. But I think this is a really good example of what I saw when I first looked at the routes and where we're going to. But thank you, Matt. I think that's what I'll do with the parents as well. I think it just so you can see it better when you see what we were like and what we are now or what we're proposing. Any other feedback? So where we're at now is that it's with principals. And I think, Jim, I think I appreciate Mary, you having that conversation. Anyone else in terms of you know, the different routes and what you're seeing? Um, you've got all those links in my pr uh, presentation if you want to look deeper into it. Um, it's going to be a hard conversation. It will be some sacrifices for certain families to know too that, you know, we're human beings, that, you know, we'll understand situations, but we're really trying to commit to those that are our stops. That's the expectation. Um, it's a bit, if it's a hardship that really uh, principals are supporting, then we can have conversations. But we really want to stick to this criteria and really make sure that there's equity on transportation across the district. Great. Thank you, Sherry. And uh, just, I'll just say that uh, I really appreciate this. You know, I know that it kind of, the, the final trigger was, was kind of finance related because of the number of people trying to get additional, you know, stops added. Um, but I think that we've heard from, from writing in particular for um, a number of years, you know, because it's pretty challenging being so far away. Uh, Kellington's not dissimilar to that. Uh, Barnard and Pomfret were probably closer, but I just appreciate the fact that the, there's not a lot less stops in, in the Barnard route, but it's just smarter, right? So the kids will get to school on time instead of being late so they can get their breakfast at, at, the, at the high school and um, and it's just a little bit tighter. So, um, you know, I think even minor changes can have a pretty big impact on what the, the student's morning looks like. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks for your support. All right. We're up to committee time already, guys. Do we have any updates from the policy committee at all? I don't think. I don't think so. But correct me if I'm wrong, Sam. I think we the the meeting was just more about laying out the future since everybody left Sam. So <laughs> looking for new members, I'll be reaching out to board members. Um, FYI, but um, for now, no update. Uh, buildings and grounds. Dave Bryce, Jim Half. Um, buildings and grounds continues to go to each one of the elementary schools, um, taking a look at the buildings coming together. Jim Fenn and Joe have been working with the, the, the wants 
and the needs from each of the elementary school principals. Um, conversation that I've had with you, Bryce, um, we do need to start working on, on I believe, Killington, Barnard, Pomford, and Reading. Oh, well, Pomford, maybe not yet, but you know how we're plowing our roads and we have to meet up with the select boards of each of the other towns to try to work out those towns that um, are not plowing their elementary schools, which it's a lot, it's a lot more savings um, to the taxpayers to have the town pick it up instead of the schools. Um, I've also floated a few times, a few years, which you know, Bryce, on the uh, Woodstock Middle School High School. Uh, I'm not looking for Woodstock to pay for plowing the Woodstock Middle School High School. I'm looking for us to work together as a, uh, as a group of towns to send our kids to that school and find out how much it costs to plow that whole uh, building and then break it up just like we do with our uh, course per student uh, and each town would get billed. And then also working on um, how Killington is still the um, American Red Cross building. We maintain the um, generator at our school for the, for the elementary school, in the elementary school as the backup, not just for when their power goes out, but when we need it for an American Red Cross building. So we need to start reaching out to, I would say, um, the town manager of each of the towns and um, of uh, at least one select board member. And let's get that conversation going. Bryce, you and I have talked about that for quite some time now, and I think we know where we have to go with it. I'll let you take it from there. Yeah, I'll just, just for reference for those that might not be familiar, I think that at the crux of it is things changed a little bit during the Act 46 merger. Um, so we're in a state now that was not the way it was five plus years ago. Um, long story short, it's cheaper when we pay things out of our municipal budget. And that's why often for years, uh, the towns did pay for certain aspects of each of the individual elementary schools. Um, because it's just a straight cost, right? When it goes into the school budget, then you're subject to uh, all the Act 60, 68 things, um, the CLA, the, the, uh, the, the student count, all these studies, right? So as we all know that we give significantly more money goes out to the state than, than what comes back to us to support our students. So um, it's, they're fairly small groups of money in the scheme of things, but that's what he's referencing is that if we can get back to kind of a, a pre- merger standpoint, there's there's potentially some cost savings for the taxpayers. So it's really just a shifting of dollars on paper, but it has a, it has a positive effect from the, the taxpayers in our budget. So speaking of budgets, finances up next. Yeah, thanks, Bryce. Um, yeah, the, um, uh, these, are, these are buildings and grounds and, and finance um, uh, kind of collaborative topics. And on that point, uh, Jim mentioned that uh, Joe and Jim Fenn were you know, meeting with principals to talk about wants and needs. Um, I want to thank those two guys for the work they've done on the district capital improvements plan. That's the first time we've had something like that coming together. Uh, Jim presented it to the finance committee last month, a, a draft of it. It's pretty exciting, a five-year capital improvements plan that will give us the ability to have a blueprint um, and, and a kind of a roadmap for how we, how we spend um, you know, finances on on uh, on buildings and, and grounds type issues so that's that's wonderful thank you guys for that uh, only other real news on the the finance front coming up is the um, district uh, informational session in advance of town meeting town meeting days on March 1st and the information session will be on February the 24th uh, uh, Jim Fenn and I'll be presenting um, the overview of the the budget that the board voted on at the last meeting so that'll be um, that'll be exciting as always. Awesome. Thanks. Oh, Jim, we got a hand up. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, I just want to remind. Um, I spoke with uh, Brad James I think a week ago. You're breaking up pretty bad, Jim. 
spot that we're now being a double digit increase this. At this point, they should have all the. Can you hear me? You got me now? I, I can Yellow. get you now. Yellow. You might want to start over. Okay. So, same time last year, Killington had a double increase, tax increase, I think, of 11%. It ended up at being 5% um, because um, the education board receives everybody's budgets that they're going to be proposing. Um, they're predicting right now a 4.5% increase, I believe, across the board. Hopefully, that will come in lower, which will lower the base rate that we have that gets hit by the CLA. Um, also, we don't see yet the $45 million or the $90 million or whatever they want to propose to put into us. So by the time we get to that meeting that Bryce and Jim, I mean, Ben and Jim will have, we should have the real tax number. So it will be, I'm waiting to see that real tax number. I don't think we're going to stay in double digits. Thank you, though, Ben. Um, next, uh, Adam, anything you want to say about negotiations? Uh, negotiations, well, you know this, Bryce, because you're on the negotiations committee with me. Um, negotiations with ESP continues, um, and uh, that is my update. I don't really have anything else. We don't have anybody else. You're actually not even on the negotiations committee. Uh, so the negotiations committee, Sam, if it makes you feel any better, I'm the only person on that committee. Yeah. So we haven't had any negotiations meetings, I guess, lately, besides the ones with the, the, the actual negotiations. Correct. Um, Carrie, do you want to give an update for your working group? Sure. Uh, we had a productive meeting in January with um, a variety of um, stakeholders on the team and um, a smaller group of the committee has been working on the um, uh, the name isn't coming to me, but <laughs> the document that we're going to send out to the public. Um, the survey. A survey, yes, yes. Um, the survey that's going to be sent out to the public. Um, and so a number of eyes have seen that, and we are hoping to uh, finalize it at our meeting on Wednesday night. We're trying to do once a month, one hour meetings or right around one hour because everyone's busy. Um, and so, uh, so far so good. And that would be on the district rebranding name. There continues to be some uh, level of concern about discussing the mascot, but um, I have invited anyone who has any concerns at all or wishes to be on the in the group to come to our meetings and, and make their voice heard there rather than um, in other places where uh, there's no opportunity for dialogue. So I think that we'll be swimming along on this. Thanks, Carrie. Uh, ben, did you have any additional updates with the high school, middle school group that you wanted to? Um, we did have a meeting of the, um, the new build committee and that was really just, uh, it had been, 10 months since the last time that we uh, had met as a, as a group, uh, the working group. Um, it's a good, good meeting. Um, not a whole lot to report. I think the, the school board really is, uh, you know, uh, pretty well informed in terms of um, development. So it was really uh, just a catch up in terms of all the things that uh, have happened over the past 10 months, but uh, it's good to get the, the group back together again and kind of focused on um, some of the more, the fundraising efforts that have, that have come together. Great. Thanks. All right. Next up, can I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I think that's next up. So move. Second. Is anyone opposed to the motion? If not, the consent agenda passes. That was a, that was a easy one. Minutes. Okay, hey, um, Bryce, can you just read off for the public what's on the consent agenda? Yeah, no, that's a good good call, Jim. So the consent agenda um, for this one is just the uh, the January third meeting minutes and the January twelfth special meeting minutes. That's what we're approving. Thanks, Jim. All right, we're at that time. Members of the public, again, have an opportunity here to, to speak. If there's anything you'd like to, to say, uh, please go ahead and raise your Zoom hand.
And if not, uh, there's no executive session tonight. So it's reflection time. What do we think, guys? Hour and a half? It's not bad. I just want to, again, I guess, thank some, some thank yous all around. I'll thank, thank PJ for stepping up. Thanks to everybody who's, who's on the board and staying on the board. And thanks to those that have been on the board and are, are now leaving the board. But, you know, it, it takes a village. And between the board members and all the faculty we heard from today, the administration, the support staff, the whole, the whole nine, it's obviously a large group of people. Um, having the, uh, the students on has been great. Uh, so thank you to the students that were here too. Uh, Jim? Yes. Um, to make things a little bit better, I would like at some point that we maybe have, uh, since the buildings and uh, new building and grounds or new building middle school, high school, and buildings and grounds, kind of have a meeting in the next month or two so we can uh, start chatting on that. And then uh, also, uh, Kerry, great job on if someone, maybe Jim Fenn, could find out so we can work into our budget what's it going to cost to end up doing the renaming because i believe there's some cost that's going to have to go across the board so that when we get to hit that question we could say we knew it and this is where it's at and where it's in the budget thank you guys thanks jim all right all well, if i can have a motion we can uh i make a motion to adjourn Second, I'll second. second. We all second it. I think we're letting PJ off too easy for her first meeting. Let's keep going. <laughs> all right. Don't scare her away. Thank you, Thank you everybody. You can with I'm happy to join one of these committees. I just once I learn more about them, I guess. Um, yeah, we'll be we'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a good Thanks night. Everybody. Have a great night. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Care. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Good night.